On behalf of the First Baptist Church family here in Pulaski, Tennessee, thank you so much for joining us for this worship service. We think you'll pretty quickly see that we are not a bunch of spit and polish professionals. We're not the most gifted people around. As a matter of fact, we make all kinds of mistakes. We're a long way from perfect. And maybe you can relate to us in that way. And that's okay. Because our belief is that God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the only perfect person who ever lived. And Jesus took His perfection and did something amazing with it. He offered Himself as payment for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, and is right now preparing a place for us to be with Him. The service you're about to watch, hiccups and all, is not about us performing for God, each other, or you. This service is about a bunch of imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We have prayed that God meets you right where you are as you enter into this service with us. And if you're ever able, we would be thrilled for you to join us live and in person. May the living God be glorified in this service, in our lives, and in yours, now and forever. And again, thank you so much for joining us. If you are going to kids' camp, uh, I heard a few of you didn't get my message this week, uh, so I was just going to remind you that if you're going to kids' camp, we have our camp party tonight at 5.30, and you need to make sure you bring a white t-shirt with you tonight, and pizza will be provided. We also have our pool party coming up, and that, uh, if you want to sign up for that, it's in the children's hallway. It's July 28th. It's on a Tuesday, and pizza's provided for that, too. Man, pizza, like, summer just smell in children's ministry smells like pizza and sunscreen. That's, that's what it smells like. Uh, so we'll have pizza for that too. And also, if you uh, would like to send messages to our kids this week at Kids Camp, uh, there'll be a link posted on our children's Facebook page. So if you're not added to our Facebook page, um, you can just click in FBC Children's Ministry and be added and you can send kids emails throughout the week. Um, and that link will be studentlifeforkids.com, but it'll be, it'll be on the website if you'd like to send them emails. They love getting mail. All right, so today I have... Two lemons, very good. And I brought them because, have you guys ever heard of the phrase, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade? Have you ever heard that before? Yes, in You've heard it in movies? What does it mean, Wyatt? I don't know. Not sure? <laughs> well, good, you're going to find out. What's it mean, Aubrey? When life ha hands you lemons, make lemonade. You have to drink it all. You have to drink it all? Well, you might. <laughs> Anybody else want to give it a shot? Basically, what it means is, to make the most of a bad situation. Because when you eat a lemon, Emily, you want to take a bite of this lemon for me? Okay. All right, take a bite out of it. Ready? Stand up so everybody can see your pretty face when you bite. <laughs> All right, you don't have to, you don't have to. Mmm, what's she doing, y'all? Mm, squeezing, her, squeezing her face together like this. Why, why does she do that? Because, because it's sour, that's right. So sometimes we get put in situations that are kind of sour, don't we? Things that, are, things that go, don't go the way that we plan or things that happen to us that we don't like, that are just bad. And it can be sour. So when life hands us bad situations, we should make lemonade. Now, do you think lemonade tastes better than lemons? Yes. Let's get Emily's opinion. Way better? Yeah, it is way better because it it's not just sour, but it has water and sugar in it. So it's a little sweeter. It tastes so much better. So when it's saying when life hands you lemons, make lemonade, it means make the most out of a bad situation. Find a way to make it better. And life is like that for us because like I said before, things happen in our life that we can't control. We can't control the things that happen to us, to the situations that pop up that we didn't plan for, or things that just happen for, for no reason at all, but, but at least the reason that we can see. But today, we're, we're talking about, who have we been talking about the past couple weeks? 
in children's church? Who? Do you remember? We've been talking about Joseph, remember? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We've been talking about Joseph, and today we're still talking about Joseph. And Joseph has been thrown a lot of difficult situations so far, what we've, been, what we've been talking about. And today, he's thrown into another situation. But we're going to learn today that Joseph made the most of the situations that he was in. He could have gotten really bitter and angry in some of the situations that were given to him that he couldn't control. But instead, he chose to serve and honor God anyway in everything that happened to him. And I hope that today, that it teaches us something, that we should do that in our life when things aren't going the way that we plan. Because in Joseph's life, we'll see today that all the things that were happening that he didn't understand, God was working out something amazing during that time. He was working out part of his big plan. And God's doing that with us too. So we have to remember that when things aren't going the way that we plan, we need to make the most out of it and honor God and trust God anyway. And maybe you don't like to clean your room. But you know what you can do? Listen to music. You can sing and dance. Make the most of it. Make the most out of all the things that you, that, that you have in your life and make lemons out of lim- like No, make lemonade out of lemons. Okay? All right, let's bow our heads. Uh, dear God, we thank you for um, all the parts that are in our life, God. The, the things that we consider bad and the things that are good. And uh, I just pray that you help us um, to just praise you through all of it. Uh, I ask today that um, all the people in this room, there's bound to be people that, um, that feel like they don't understand whatever they're going through. They don't understand why um, life's kind of dealt them the hand that they have. And I just pray, God, that today that they will praise and worship you anyway and just um, that you will just give them comfort through whatever they're going through. And uh, I just ask that we take, um, we get encouraged by the story of Joseph today as we go over that in Children's Church. Uh, dear God, we love you and praise you, and we just pray that this time honors you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
In Matthew chapter 3, God tells us about this crazy guy out in the Jordan River wearing camel skin and fur and eating locusts and honey, and he's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And one day it was a lot like every other day that he'd been out there, except that the Lord Jesus, his cousin, God in the flesh, walked over the bank of that river and said, I want you to baptize me. And, he, and John had said, I'm not worthy to untie your sandal. And Jesus said, this is fitting for me to fulfill all righteousness. Not that he had anything he needed to be forgiven for, but that in a powerful way what we see Jesus doing is choosing to identify himself with us. He's our model, of, of course, and what we need to do in obedience to God. But in the act of baptism itself, we see the Lord choosing to identify with us. And I think as we all sort of uh, felt that emotion welling up in us listening to Shannon's testimony, that, that's coming from the realization that the Son of God is choosing us, and we can choose Him back. And Shannon, we've heard pretty clearly uh, your testimony of faith that you believe that you're a sinner and that Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. Is that true? All right. Well, Shannon, my sister, based on your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, and your choice to identify yourself with him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God in heaven, we are in awe of your love, Lord, of your power over sin and death through your Son, and also, Lord, the, the love and the power that's welled up in Shannon's heart to get her over this fear of talking on camera and to being up front and to, um, and to being a public sort of person in a moment like this. Lord, we know that comes from a deep and true place for her, and Lord, we thank you for her testimony of faith. Lord, we thank you for her desire to give you glory, as she said. God, we pray that you would really bless this decision in her life to publicly identify with you, that you'd protect her and lead her and encourage her, that you'd deepen her walk, and that she would um, be eager to testify of what you have done and are doing in her life. And Lord, we too now, in this worship service, want to give you the glory you deserve. So we give every part to you through Christ and by your Spirit. Amen. From creation to the cross, and from the cross into eternity, God orchestrated everything. He did that. And Shannon said it best, who are we to not give him the praise? So let's stand this morning as we sing hymn number 48, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. We're going to do verses 1 and 3.
sing is How Great Thou Art. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. at all. 
shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee Let us pray. Lord, how great you really are. We just can't even imagine words to really describe it, Lord. We just praise your name. Lord, thank you for what you have given us and help us not take it for granted. We just um, ask your forgiveness for when we have sinned and we just um, ask that you help us be quick in forgiving others, Lord. Just grant us wisdom, Lord. Help us understand your, your plan, your wants for us. Um, we just pray Pray for those that are being persecuted throughout the Lord, uh, throughout the world, Lord, just um, near and far. Be with the missionaries that are out there. And um, Lord, we just pray for the lost as well. We pray for lost family members and lost friends. Uh, we just ask that this offering we're about to take up is used according to your will. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we all know well, we make plans, but the Lord orders our steps. Uh, things don't go the way we always hope they will, and that's a good thing, quite honestly. Uh, that being said, this is week eight of eight of our little Hot Topics series here, and if you missed it in Rodney's announcements, next week is our Sunday School Open House, and so we'll have two worship services like normal, and Sunday School will be a little bit different. We'll meet in the, the fellowship hall, but the week after that, we're having sort of a dinner on the grounds type thing with each other, a fellowship meal and a combined service, and that will be a Lord's Supper Sunday, unless the Lord leads otherwise. So you have that to look forward to. But today we're sort of hovering around the whole idea or the whole relationship between faith and science, and asking ourselves the question, are faith and science compatible? I will admit to you that I am in way over my head, um, even thinking about this topic. Um, as I was doing research this week, I sort of had an idea of what I thought I might want to share or speak about, and, and, and pretty soon what I thought was the little kiddie pool there at the rec center or whatever, it, I don't know that we have one here, but you know the little kiddie pool that you sit down in and you kind of just scoot around? Well, pretty soon I found myself way out in the deep end just like, oh my gracious, what, what to, do, to do now? Because you can come at this this whole concept of faith and science from all kinds of different angles. And some of the questions that we might find ourselves asking, does the soul or consciousness exist as a separate and distinct entity, or is it a function of the brain? That's a question of faith and science and, and the crossover. Does science provide evidence for intelligent design, or does evolutionary biology suffice without it? It's another question we could ask. Is it possible to influence the healing of persons by praying for them at a distance, or are there tests performed, or are the tests that we try to, to gauge that with completely unreliable? Faith in science. Is there empirical evidence for the claim that near-death experiences enable us to reach the other side, or are there alternative physiological and psychological explanations for these things? Faith in science. Does the Big Bang hypothesis in astronomy point to God as the cause of the universe, or is the latter claim beyond science and purely speculative? And are you swimming with me out in the deep end? Uh, I'm not going to answer all those questions for you today, I hate to tell you. Uh, and there are a lot of really smart people who, who take a, an entire weekend to try to answer the questions, and you're still going to leave wanting. Uh, and especially, okay, well, well, I changed my mind. In the next 22 minutes, I'm going to answer all those questions for you right now. Now, that isn't happening. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to dip our, our toe into the pool a little bit, if you will, 
And sometimes people say, you know, why do we talk about these kind of topics on a Sunday morning? Last week, we, we sort of admitted to ourselves that most of us probably aren't going to do a whole lot of research on these things on our own anyway. We feel a little intimidated by it, and we're just not going to dig into it. We don't know what books to read. We don't know what websites are credible or whatever it is, so we're just going to kind of leave it alone. So if we don't talk about it here, where are we? I don't know. I don't know that we are in a lot of respects, but more toward the pastoral, I'd like to maybe share a little illustration with you. Okay, obviously you, hear, you have a teacher here, a mother here, um, some, an instructor of some kind um, working with these girls on their, on their math. And four plus four equals eight. And we all say, that's great. And that's true. I had a conversation with one of our teenagers here in the church not too long ago, and he was a very early second semester German student. And I said, how's German going? And he said, well, he said, I pretty much got it. You pretty much got it. You pretty much got German, and you're just starting your second semester of German in a public school. Yeah, you pretty much, pretty much got it. Well, I did a little poking around on the Internet, and it turns out if you, the, the, the linguists that are really proficient in this stuff say that you would have to spend 420, the average person with the average language has to spend 420 24-hour days. So you break that into eight-hour days, that's three, over three and a half, almost four years before you even begin to approach um, proficiency. Here's, here's my point as it relates to why we do these things on Sunday morning. I think if we're not careful, we get, we get a little bit like that student who thinks he's got things pretty much wired because we're not wrestling with the difficult issues thinking about things that escape our ability to understand them keeps us humble, keeps us hungry. You know, it keeps us asking questions. It, it reminds us that we don't have the answers. It reminds us that there are very eager neighbors that we have that are wrestling with some of the questions that you and I just take for granted. So part of the reason that we do this on a Sunday morning is, is maybe pastoral in my world because I, I think we need to leave the elementary message about the Messiah. We, most of us, I'd say 98, 99% of us in this room agree that Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose to take away the sin of the world. We say we believe it. Have we received it in our hearts? That's another issue. But we're going to say that we believed it. And so if we get in here every Sunday... And we just hit these big beach ball topics all the time. Just we, we get so comfortable with ourselves that like that German student, we think we've got it. We think that Christianity boils down to four plus four. It doesn't. It doesn't. Now, at the core of our faith, all that we need to preach at the core of our faith is Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'll agree with that. He is our message. I'll agree with that. But in terms of us really growing in our faith and engaging our faith and engaging our culture and realizing that our high school students, our middle school students, are having conversations in their hallways and in, you know, over Twitter and on, by text and whatever about these things, about the soul and the body and the near-death experiences and all this stuff. And if we as a church family don't help them, if some of us who are newer believers, even in adulthood, don't get some of this, you know, we oversimplify the faith. And quite honestly, I'm going to suggest we get bored with it. We need to stay stimulated. We need to leave the elementary teachings and press on, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, and we will do this if God permits. We will continue to work at it. Even if you should suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. Don't fear what they fear or be disturbed, but honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. That's that first sort of idea. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. Are you ready to answer if somebody asks you what the connection is between faith and science? What answer would you give them? Your neighbor, your cousin, your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad. What answer do you give them? I ah, call Brother Tony. Google it. You know? No, you, you need to have a reason in your own walk. 
I need to have a reason in my own walk. We, we need to be equipped to answer those questions. He gave some as pastors and teachers for the training of the saints and the work of the ministry, the building up of the body in Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And that's not just unto salvation. That's in the outworking of the gospel that transforms our lives not just unto peace with God, but in terms of our, our practice in this world of reaching this world for Christ. So I, I think biblically we're sort of commanded to engage topics like this. I think it's good for us to do this. So that's part of my answer to why we kind of dig in on Sunday mornings. If you wanted to simplify it with an image, it would be to put tools in our toolbox. It would be to give us some, some ability. Those tools in that little toolbox aren't going to handle big jobs. But they'll give us some ability to, to interact in some way with these issues. So the question, faith and science, we might start out in Psalm 19 this morning, if you have your, your Bibles. Psalm 19, and we'll read four verses. I think that's page 354 in those little uh, pew Bibles there, the little black pew Bibles. And I didn't get my hands on a big one in time to get the page number for that, but Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4. And those of us who have a relationship with the living God through His Son by faith, we read these verses right here and our heart just soars. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day, they, being the, the, the elements of creation, they pour out speech. In other words, they're proclaiming who God is. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, meaning they're not actual words is what this means. There are no words. Their voice is not heard audibly, but their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Creation screams out that God is there. Creation screams out that He's a God of beauty and order, that He's a God of power, that, that he, is, he, he is full of wisdom and all these things. Creation screams this stuff out. And so faith and science then, how do we begin to interact with this? Well, depending on who you listen to or who you read or or whatever. Some are going to say yes, and some are going to say no. Some secular scientists might say, yes, these views are compatible. Maybe philosophically compatible in terms of science, that God is an option to the science you know, question that faith could be, the supernatural could be. But when you really press secular scientists on this issue, a lot of them are going to come down this way. First of all, science, as they would say, it could loosely be defined as, as that exercise that puts forward a hypothesis about why things are the way they are, uses the, these hypotheses, I should say, to make predictions about how things are going to be and test those predictions against empirical evidence. And that's what she's doing in the test tube there. She's testing her theory to see if her theory pans out, right? So that's sort of what that's about. It's about science, testing your, your hypotheses against the evidence. All right, some of these people might say this, that faith then is helpful and it's compatible with science because faith is that exercise of focusing on the issues of ethics and philosophy and maintaining a sense of wonder about the universe. Well, that's sort of a manby, pamby, weak, noodly version of faith in my world. That doesn't sound like a faith that I'm wanting to grab onto. But scientists are going to say, psychologists are going to say, these, these ivory tower people are going to say, yes, science and faith are compatible because faith is that thing that some people do to entertain themselves so they can be emotionally comfortable so we can wrestle with issues of ethics. It's basically a psychology exercise, but it's wrapped up in this talk of the supernatural. That's how they're going to say it. So they're going to say, yes, science and faith are compatible in that way. Other, more hardline scientists are going to say, no, they're not compatible. You cannot say that faith and science are compatible. Faith, they would say, involves a belief in or the acknowledgement in the supernatural being who is powerful, conscious, he has a personality, he's conscious, and he's capable in intervening in the natural order. He's capable of, of moving into time and space and making something happen whether he chooses to or not. That's what faith is. 
Now, if you define faith that way, the average scientist is going to say that's not compatible with science because science assumes events don't have purpose or cause. There, there's nothing outside reaching into the glove of creation making things happen. There's no, there's, no, there's no prime mover. There's no cause to the actions. They just are. Well, see, even in that, you've already you've dismissed in, in the, the presuppositions for science the existence of the supernatural. But that's basically what modern science is. It is interesting, by the way, this is a little a free trivia tidbit, that theology, the study of God, used to be called the queen of the sciences. Did you know that? Theology, the study of God, used to be called the queen of the sciences because it was understood that everything else we see was subordinate to the one who gave it. But we've migrated away from that. Now science, and the way that we hear it and talk about it in our culture, is different. Science assumes events don't have purpose or cause. They simply conform to the laws of nature. And of course, we would say, who put the laws there, right? Um, there's no need to invoke a mechanism to sustain the universe. Now, I'm getting itchy. I'm, want, I'm wanting to find whoever said that and sit down with them over coffee and say, can we talk a minute? And I pulled those quotes from people that I have in my notes, but I don't want to bore you with their names. But God says this, all things have been created through him, it means Jesus in context, and for him. Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, the eternal son of God, was the agent of creation. God the Father created all that we see through his son and for his son. Woo, now we're getting somewhere. Right? He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Col Colossians says that. Hebrews says this. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation or expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He speaks it. He declares it, and it's held together. That's all it takes. He doesn't have to get around and like touch everything. He just speaks it, and it has unity. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. So science and faith in that respect cannot coexist because we would say the, the word of God that we just read that we believe to be God's word says that Jesus is holding together the universe by his spoken word. He declared it and it is. The word of his power is holding it all together. We just read that the Father basically used His Son and the Spirit, we read in, in, in Genesis, hovering over the water and all. The, the Son and the Spirit were involved in all the members of the Trinity. But, you know, the agents, of, the primary agents of creation were the Son and the Spirit. So bringing, bringing all this into being. And then in terms of the supernatural invading the natural, we read it in Colossians there that... The, I mean, in Hebrews there, the exact representation of His nature... God in the flesh. Sean Carroll, um, a scientist that I think it's the uh, California Institute of, uh, of Technology or something. I'll have to look that reference up for second service. But he's a cosmologist, you know, looking at the, the universe and trying to figure out how all these things work, says this. It should be clear that by these definitions of faith and science, materialism, that's, you know, the natural order of things, science, and theism, the belief that there is a God, are incompatible. The former, materialism, says that everything follows the rules, and the second says that God is an exception to those rules. So time and space and physics and weight, you know, and, and not being bound by time and space. So if there's a God who exists outside of time and space that cannot be tested, essentially, then that doesn't fit into the, un the modern understanding of science. So most hardcore scientists are going to say faith and science are not compatible because of the definitions they use for faith and science. All right. Well, of course, there are other positions. There are mitigating positions from Christian scientists and whatnot. One of those that I, that I found an interesting perspective on was actually a Catholic cosmologist, and he said this, Science can't disprove God. Scientific evidence has to come from observation of things within the universe, and God is outside the universe. 
He's involved in it, but he doesn't exist in it. He exists everywhere at the same time. He's omnipresent. How can you use evidence from within the universe to disprove a being that is outside it? It doesn't work. And he's right. We can't put God in our little box and say, you're not playing according to our rules so you don't exist. He existed in himself in eternity past. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need time and space to exist. He just exists. That's what we understand from his word about what he's told us about himself, which is really, really powerful. So let me go back and ask the question again. Are faith and science compatible? Are you confused? I'm going to say this. It depends on your terms. It depends on how you're using those words. So if you get in a discussion with someone and you're moved by God to invest in him or her, if you're, you're compelled by the Spirit, sort of like, you know, how beautiful is Shannon's testimony? You know, basically that the Lord made her in, in a deep, healthy way restless. She had to do something. We've been there. We've been where she is. Not just, not just of issues of expressing our faith through baptism or walking an aisle, but I'm talking about the Lord says, good grief, that person in need needs money. We can't sleep. That person needs a phone call. That person needs a note of encouragement. That person needs prayer. And we, we're just agitated. We're restless. And we can't, we can't get peace until we just stop and give it to the Lord, right? You've been there, haven't you? You know what you need to do, and you just do it. And you're restless until you do it. So it could be that God gives you a relationship, and you're building into someone, and he says, I want you to be a part of me answering her question or his question. I want you to give a defense of your faith as it relates to faith and science because that's where she is. That's where he is. Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might save some. In other words, I'm empathizing. I'm getting into their skin. I'm thinking the way they think, not agreeing with everything they're saying. I'm just entering into their world to empathize with them. So are we ready to do that? And if somebody says, are faith and science compatible, what we can say is, help me understand what you mean by those words. It would help me to answer your question if I knew what you meant by faith and science, because I've just given you three different scenarios, yes and no, just now. Okay, I'm going to say this, basically. Okay, the answer that we can give as evangelical Bible-reading Christians is yes. Faith and science are compatible if, by faith, what we mean is a situation that involves a God who's powerful, conscious, and established the natural order. He's above what's created. That's what faith means. Of course, as evangelical Christians, we're going to say he's Trinitarian and all these other things. But faith involves a personal, powerful God outside of time and space. And science involves observing things he put in place within the natural order. So things are behaving the way they are because he said so. He's... He's declared the end from the beginning. He's declared these laws. He, he's given the rules by which the universe operates. So basically what we're doing is discovering what he's declared to be true. And, and you know as well as I do, if you go back and look, at, and look at the longer history of science, we're unlearning things all the time. Things that were fact 300 years ago are no longer fact that light is energy. It's not just energy. Light has mass because it bends with gravity. So how does something have the, the properties of energy but bend with gravity? It has mass. Do we think that light has mass before? Well, no, we really didn't two or 300 years ago. I just heard an, an advertisement on the radio that that our cell phones are going to start, they're experimenting, right, or it's about to come, come around where they're recharging our cell phones by Wi-Fi. Recharging our cell phones by Wi-Fi, how does that work? Well, it's, it's got to be connected to what I just mentioned. Something about energy and matter and whatever else. It's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. All right, so the answer can be yes, because by definition of proper science, science has to stay open to new possibilities. So we're discovering things that God has said are true all the time. And we're learning that we didn't know what we thought we knew, if, if that makes sense. And by the way, I think this is part of what heaven's going to be about. I think our hunger to travel, 
and see waterfalls and see mountains and look through telescopes and fly and swim in the oceans and all these sorts of things. I think that comes from a God-given desire to explore His majesty. Just discover how creative He is. And I think that's part of what we're going to do in heaven. In the new heaven and the new earth, by the way. Not just heaven and the clouds. New earth. That we're going to be exploring things that God has made, discovering how amazing He is in new ways without sin in the world. All right, some of you probably were thinking of this passage in Romans. You can turn there if you want to. I'm going to read a few verses and then put up the last, last couple. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So God is well within His right to judge us because we're not responding to truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what He has made. As a result, people are without excuse to the fact that He's there. For though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. And here, I think is where faith or religion and science intersect. Right here in this verse. They did not glorify Him as God or show Him gratitude. I hope we are. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. Remember the queen of the sciences? for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. We want to control our environments. We all know this. With our kids, our spouses, our families, our jobs, we want to control what we do. And quite honestly, we would love, emotionally on a bad day, we would love if we could just fold God up and put Him in our wallet and take Him out when we want to do what we want. We would love that, that we could control what He does in our lives. We're that arrogant, we're that prideful to say at our hearts, to say, I will, not what you be, will be done. So we want to worship what we can understand, but God eclipses our understanding. If you're taking notes, you might write down Isaiah 55 and read that a little bit. But then it says this, God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to, to sin, but this specific one, sexual immorality or impurity, so that their bodies were degraded. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served something created, their own minds, science, money, whatever it is, instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. So when we choose to take God out of the equation, we're going to worship something that we make in our minds, with our hands, with machines, whatever. We're going to substitute. We're going to put ourselves in His place, and that's dangerous. By the way, if you wanted to, um, I don't know, have a little fun discovering what some really, really smart people thought about the living God, write down the names Johannes or Johann Kepler, the astronomer, Blaise Pascal, a mathematician. These were all people that I stumbled across as I was getting ready that I don't have time to talk to you about. Robert Boyle and chemistry, Isaac Newton mathematics and other things, Michael Faraday, who was an inventor, Louis Pasteur, George Washington Carver, Johannes Kepler, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Louis Pasteur, and George Washington Carver. Check them out. These are really bright people who had some interesting things to say. But I'm going to quote from one to kind of start wrapping this up. This is um, a pretty interesting and eminent scientist, Werner von Braun, who who was German, he has an interesting story, um, but German and ended up building rockets here for NASA. But he said this, it's difficult for me to understand a, a scientist who does not acknowledge the presence of a superior rationality behind the existence of the universe as it is to comprehend a theologian who would deny the advance of science. Far from being independent or opposing forces, science and religion are sisters. There is certainly no scientific reason why God cannot retain the same position in our modern world he held before we began probing his creation with the telescope and cyclotron. I don't even know what a cyclotron is, but, uh, but evidently we used it to probe stuff, uh, the cyclotron. But that's what Werner von Braun says. 
And this is a guy who, who has circuits connected that I'll never have connected. He, he was able to use parts of his brain that I haven't accessed ever yet. Um, and, and he's saying this. It, this is interesting. This is his tombstone right below 1977. You know what it says right there? You probably have a hard time reading. It says Psalms 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's pretty powerful. When you think about somebody that had that kind of God-given ability, whose entire life was oriented around astronomy and rocketry and, and, and literally being a rocket scientist, and he submitted everything he knew to be true to his creator as he used science. So, are science and faith compatible? Yes, they are if you'll use the, use the terms the right way. They really are. But all of this, of course, the truth of God that we see in the natural order is supposed to point us back to who He is and our place before Him. And as Shannon showed us in his baptism, the, the Lord says, the Lord God says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus, His Son, said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father. If you will identify yourself with me through faith, you will become a new creation. The old things are gone and the new things will come. So don't get so distracted by all the questions we can't answer yet. Ask yourself the question, am I right with God through faith in his son? H have we all done what Shannon showed us to do? And I'm, and I'm embarrassing her probably by using her as an example, but... We all need to take that step. We all need to humble ourselves before the Lord and worship the Creator instead of the created things. So hopefully wherever you are in this faith journey, um, the Lord has moved in your life and encouraged you this morning. If you have anything you want to share with the church about a decision or you have somebody that has been brought to mind that is struggling with some of these questions and has not yet embraced our faith in Christ, we'd open the altar for prayer. So would you please stand and we'll, we'll pray. God in heaven, we give you praise as a God of order and majesty, a God who's transcendent and above all time and space, who's outside of the universe, but yet who is imminent, who is right here with us in our midst, a God who loves us so much that you would sacrifice your only son, that Lord Jesus, you would come to kick dust on this planet, to redeem what's broken, Lord, to to live the life we could not live in perfect obedience, not just externally with your actions, but with your thoughts, with your passions, with the secret hidden parts that if we've, think it, if we've thought it, we've done it, with those parts. And Holy Spirit, that you would condescend to indwell the church is marvelous. Lord, we give you praise for your relentless love toward us. And all of us in our own way need to respond somehow to that in the quietness of our heart or maybe to make a decision known to the church or maybe to enter into a time of prayer. So we give you this time of invitation through Christ our Lord. Amen. His love, think about His goodness, think about His grace that's brought us through.
that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. If you would, just bow your heads with me and, and just pray for someone right now who you know does not yet know the Lord Jesus. Father, we say together that only you can break down those walls, only you can draw hearts, only you can cause the scales to fall off eyes because we know it by experience, those of us who are your children by faith in your Son. So Lord, we commit all these people that we just prayed for to you through your magnificent Son and by your Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen.